say uh, a word of your choice three times quiet, three times medium, and three Make times it fuck. loud. Yeah. No, not fuck. It would be something like smegma moist and douchebag. <laughs> Warning, this podcast contains violence, sexuality, gore, and other horrible and disturbing things. Listener discretion is advised. Also, the hosts of this venture are ignorant dipshits, so please do not take anything they say as fact. And enjoy the show. Now, are you sitting comfortably? Good, then we'll begin. The day we had 15 homicides and 63 violent crimes, as if that's the way it's supposed to be. The atoms in your left hand probably came from a different star than your right hand. It is our basic human right to be fuck up! A second plane now has crashed into the other tower of the World Trade Center. Put chemicals in the water that turned the friggin' frogs gay! The defendant shall be incarcerated for the rest of her natural life with no possibility of parole. You are not machines! You are not cattle! You are men! We were somewhere around Barstow, on the edge of the desert, when the drugs began to take hold. 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 Oh, Cultivaritatis. Hello, occultists, and welcome back to Occultivaritatis. My name is Leon Filger. I use he and him, and along with me... Sage Marie, she and her. And... Oud Gallifrey, he and him. And joining us in studio... Seffy, she and her. Perfect. Nailed it. Um, so last year, something severely, severely fucked up happened in rural Saskatchewan. Uh, an innocent man ended up dead, and another a guilty man ended up walking free. That's fucked, so let's get fucked. It's time for What's Your Poison? Should get. So, what's your poison? Okay, so today's What's Your Poison. Um, I just got back from the Nest Creek Music Festival, uh, yeah, to did. which I you brought... You both did. I'm so jealous. Yeah. <laughs> to which I, I brought a box of Pinot Grigio. Not a box. Now, I fucked up when I went to the, the liquor store because I wanted to buy a, bo- a box of red wine <laughs> and just for whatever reason grab the Pinot Grigio, which is very much a white wine, which I really don't care for. And it was even worse when it was warm. And the box disintegrated in a rainstorm. So I literally have like a pulsating plastic <laughs> bladder full of white wine sitting on the table in front of me. But it's yellow. Let's take a video of it. Just wait, let me get my camera out and then make it pulsate. Yep. All right, go. Pulsating white wine. It is pulsating. Look at it. Bloop, 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 bloop. Good job. It's like a urine-filled waterbed. Yep. Yeah. It is, basically. Okay, so let's, let's pour U- it Urine-filled out. waterbed is the name of my <laughs> kind of new wavy punk band. I like Sage, do you want to hold that glass for me? I can't pour that. I can pour it. I just need you to hold the glass. Okay. With their hit single, Golden Showers. Yep. Mm-hmm. Um, what should have been mm. a 6 out of 10, because it's cold and I was in the forest, mm. is downgraded to a 2 out of 10 because it was the only option for <laughs> liquor I had, and it was warm. And and this Nest Creek was a shitty Nest Creek because a bunch of my volunteers didn't show up. Yeah. One of my co-coordinators was unreliable. Yeah. Fucking Ood Gallifrey had to volunteer for my team, even though he had no contractual obligation to do yeah. so, but I would have had no one to work for me otherwise. Yeah, yeah did, a, did what, like 10, 12 hours extra work? Exactly, yeah, yeah. And, and didn't even get a t-shirt. Well, you did get a t-shirt. Yeah, I bought it. Oh. <laughs> <Yeah>. Anyway... <laughs> So, Ness fucked you good, guys. Oh, yeah. yeah, it was Gosh, a bad. You and got I ha- fucked. And yep. I had to go home halfway through because like, apparently the storm of the century broke my apartment window. Oh, yeah. And, and, and the, weather, the weather turned wonderful the second you left. Oh, yeah. No. And when I got home, it was like picture perfect sunny skies yep. and my apartment was flooded. And God bless my little kitty. She could have crawled out of the hole in the window, but she's just too darn scared of the world. So <laughs> she, she didn't. So she's safe. She just cowered inside. Yeah. Poor little Zakiti. Yeah, little Zakiti. I love her. Mm-hmm. Okay, so you're rating Ood. Um, I don't know. It's it's cold and wet. It's colder <laughs> than my body temperature right now. So I think this is gonna get an extra like hot ass ball sweat day yep. bonus of one, and it's gonna put it up to five out of ten. I think. I think I'll give it a six. It, yeah. I, I I don't mind white wine occasionally, and on a hot day like today, it's kind of nice. I prefer a Chardonnay to a Pinot Grigio. Yeah, I don't really care. Okay. What about you, Sethi? Mm, I'm I'm with Leon. I'm more of a red wine drinker. Oh, me too. It'll hit the spot, but I would pick water over it. 
Mm. Yeah. Not today. Yeah. We're drinking bladder wine. Did you know some people make edible suppositories? Edible suppositories. Yeah, like <laughs> THC suppositories. Oh, okay. I was like, do you put it in your mouth? No, or I mean, your ass? do you suck it out of someone's ass? No, yeah. no. Oh, they have opium suppositories. Oh, really? So, yeah, they use them in hospitals. Yeah, yeah, mm. but that, that's not edible, though. I'm pretty sure you could put it in your mouth. Well, you probably could, but it wouldn't be called like an edible suppository. I guess I should like, say not... THC infused suppository. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Anyway, it's, it's weed you put in your ass. Yeah, I'm just saying, like, I don't know. There's lots of ways to get drunk, but some of them just don't feel right. Well, what, what was it that you <laughs> there was like a booze up your ass? Up, yeah, well, there's there's like an I don't know if it's an urban le- urban legend or if it's true, but people are like soaking tampons in vodka and then putting them up there, and it works. I yeah? believe it. I haven't, I've never tried that. I would never try it, but I believe it works. Well, you, your ass is like the inside of your mouth, as far as like thickness of the membrane. What about like your vagina? Oh, it's just the it's same. The same. Well, yeah. I guess it's all mucous membranes. Yeah, easily permeable. Neat. Yeah. Anybody out there who owns a vagina and has done vodka tampon things with it, uh, write in obfeedback at gmail.com. Yeah, I'm curious. Open our minds. It was, okay. It are we ready? It wasn't vodka. <laughs> it wasn't vodka? What was it? Gin. Oh, gin. I like that. Just minty. Juniper. Kind of piney. Yeah. <laughs> I felt like I was pine salt. <laughs> pine salt? <laughs> I felt like I was pine salt. It's juniper fresh. Colton Bushy loved his family felt very strongly about his community and just liked going out and helping other people. And that's something that I grew up knowing of him and just admiring most about him. When my brother was shot on August 9th, I was dancing at a powwow and my cousin comes up to me before I dance with tears in her eyes and she said that Coco had died. Is there any um, native people in that jury? No? We talk about unity, we talk about reconciliation. What are you going to do? In this area, there's been a lot of animosity, a lot of racism for many, many years, many generations. Colton and his Indigenous friends drove onto a settler farm one afternoon in August 2016, where he was shot in the back of the head by a non-Indigenous farmer named Gerald Stanley. An all-white jury acquitted Gerald Stanley of all charges. Colton was the baby boy of the family. Colton had a promising future with a strong work ethic. He had just received his forest fighter certificate. He was a traditional helper trained with ceremonial protocol and was always helping his people. Colton was not a thief. He was a kind and generous young man. Let's just, first of all, sit down and delineate what the three of us have researched and determine in which order we should speak. Okay. So I've got Ooh. the circumstances surrounding the death, oh, yeah. and, as well as how those circumstances relate to what was actually presented in court. Mm-hmm. Um, I did the court case situation. Yeah, um, Richard Bigley researched... Oh, fuck that guy, he's not here. Yeah, he researched... Um, how the jury was picked and whether that had an influence on the case and the verdict. Oh, and I, I, I did that too, apparently. Oh, <laughs> and I researched uh, the aftermath. Okay. Like uh, how both politicians, people and organizations reacted to the verdict and what's being done about it as we speak. Okay, so I'm so lucky to have a wonderful lawyer by the name of Rob Feist. Mm-hmm. And he practices out in North Battleford. Um, and he's a tireless social justice advocate and does a bunch of work pro bono for indigenous people and is generally a wonderful person. Mm-hmm. Yes, he is. He was outraged um, by the court proceedings and he felt that Colton Bushy was on trial rather than his killer, Gerald Stanley, which yep. I think we can all agree to. Yeah. Yep. And yep. the following is his analysis. So this is to quote uh, lawyer Rob Feist. He wrote this on the 9th of February, 2018 in North Battleford. As I have been asked by a couple people, I wanted to provide a few thoughts on the evidence at the Gerald Stanley trial. I have kept on top of the trial, as it is of historic importance to our community, and have followed the evidence closely in person, in media, and on Twitter, and attended to watch summations of the Crown and defense cases this morning. Before talking about the key issues, it is worth talking about what the key issues aren't. First, there is no debate about the basic who, when, what, and where questions. Gerald Stanley held a gun that discharged and killed Colton Bushy, and the resultant injury was the cause of his death. No debate there was a homicide or that Gerald Stanley caused that homicide. All of that is admitted by both sides. 
Second, the case is not about self-defense. All the internet yapping about castle law and property rights came to nothing at trial, and Mr. Stanley did not make a self-defense argument because the defense lawyer, knowing his job... Oh, Bigley's here. Because the defense lawyer, knowing his job, knew that Gerald Stan Stanley was not under threat when the gun was fired. In Canadian law, lethal force in self-defense is only justified in the face of a threat of serious injury or death to you or another person. That threat did not exist in this case, nope. and wisely, the defense did not grasp at that straw. This case changes nothing about right to self-defense, and those nonsense arguments should stop. The issue the jury is forced to decide on, the difference put to the, in, put to the jury, rather, is limited only to the defense of accident. And here's where the evidence put forth by Gerald Stanley is exceptionally interesting. To set the scene, you will likely know much of this, so skip this paragraph if you like. On the day in question, an SUV carrying Colton Bushy and four other young people came onto the Stanley farm and was located at various points on the property. Gerald Stanley and his son Sheldon formed the opinion that the young people had come to his farm to steal, and Mr. Stanley and Sheldon Stanley decided to give some form of chase or response. Sheldon ran toward the vehicle and smashed the windshield with a hammer he was carrying. Mr. Stanley kicked out the taillight. After the windshield was smashed, the vehicle carrying Bushy took a hard turn into the SUV, into rather an SUV owned by the Stanleys, and the Stanleys felt the crash was deliberate and potentially a run at Sheldon. Gerald Stanley ran back to his shed and got a tucker of pistol. Sheldon went to the house where there were several other firearms. One of the witnesses in a vehicle claimed that Gerald Stanley yelled at Sheldon to go to the house to get a firearm, but Sheldon's evidence was that he was going to the house to retrieve his keys. At that point, Bushy's vehicle appeared to have been immobilized in the Stanley's driveway, and two male occupants exited the vehicle. Two female occupants, occupants and Bushy, who was likely passed out or asleep, stayed inside. Now here's the crux of Mr. Stanley's evidence on defense of accident, and where Mr. Stanley's evidence becomes truly amazing. Stanley claimed that while in his shed, he loaded the pistol with three shells. He claimed that he thought he loaded two, but later realized there were three, the same number the RCMP found had been discharged. Mm -hmm. Stanley then claimed he pointed the semi-automatic up in the air and began pulling the trigger to fire, quote, warning shots. He claimed that firing two warning shots after, they, after that believed the firearm was empty. As the shots were fired, the two males who exited the vehicle ran from the scene, leaving only Bushy and two female occupants in the vehicle. Gerald Stanley, Stanley then claimed, even though he believed he had only put two rounds in the talker of, that he, believed the that he pulled the trigger several more times after the warning shots to make safe the firearm. So basically, you, you fire off all the shots till the gun is empty. Mm -hmm. Nothing happened. He then claimed he opened the side, or the slide rather, and removed the magazine, also to ensure the firearm was made safe, though there was no evidence of this taking place. Mm. Gerald Stanley then claimed he saw the riding lawnmower his wife had been driving parked on the lawn with no wife driving, and somehow formed the belief that he may have been run, or that rather she may have been run over by the vehicle containing Bushy. Gerald Stanley then claimed he ran to the Bushy vehicle and wanted to look underneath it to ensure his wife was not there. It sounds like bullshit to me so far. Yeah. Mm. He claimed as he was going to look under the vehicle, the vehicle revved its engine and he decided he needed to turn the vehicle off, which makes sense in that case. Mm. Gerald Stanley then claimed while holding the Tokarev in his right hand, everyone hold up your right hand. Imagine what's going on here. Mm -hmm. Your gun in your right hand. Is it like a gun or like it's a, a pew pew it's gun? It's a pistol. Pew okay. pew gun. Mm -hmm. it's a pew, okay. pew gun. Pew pew. Thanks. <laughs> Richard Bigley here, by the way. <laughs> so holding Stuck the Tokarev in. in his right hand, he reached through the Bushy vehicle's SUV driver's side window with his left hand to try to turn off the ignition. Now, imagine holding the gun in your right hand, pointed at Bushy, and then reaching across Bushy and the steering wheel to the other side where the key was and attempting to turn it off. Why in the fuck would you not hold the gun in the left hand, even if it was your non-dominant hand, to reach across Bushy to turn off the ignition? Especially since the gun is empty. The gun is empty. Why are you still even holding the fucking thing? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so 
Um, Rob writes, I encourage you to try this out on a vehicle and think about why you would use your left hand to turn off a vehicle as opposed to switching hands and putting the firearm in your left. Motion it out. Using your left hand makes no sense and is incredibly awkward, if not impossible. Yeah. Gerald Stanley then claimed that as he was trying to turn the ignition off, the talker F was in his right hand, pointed at Colton Bushy's skull. And Stanley like you cl- do. And Stanley claimed at that moment a, quote, hang fire occurred. There was still a shell in the chamber and the firearm discharged spontaneously without a trigger pull, killing Colton. Those fucking magic guns. Magic guns. Despite the fact that Stanley had opened the action, pulled the magazine out and repeatedly dry fired it. Mm -hmm. And despite the fact that hang fires are extremely rare and normally last less than half a second. Yep. So it's, it's total bullshit. The idea that that firearm could have gone off any length of time after having been dry fired multiple times is 100% bullshit. And the magazine removed. Magazine and removed. And the firearms exit experts, rather, at the trial were like, no, it's bullshit. But they couldn't prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the Tokarev didn't have, didn't have uh, one of these firing incidents because there was one case somewhere in the world where it did it many years ago. Oh, boy. That's probably the bullet that shot JFK. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Something like that. <laughs> Notable was uh, the uh, in the court case was the uh, firearms experts. Um, they Don't get ahead of ourselves. Oh, yeah, you're getting ahead bad. of me. Hold on. Okay. It's, it's okay. I, I still love you, though. Okay. okay, so Gerald Stanley's defense is the defense of accident. If you believe it, his defense explains all the physical evidence and most particularly a Tokarev casing found on the SUV dash and Colton's DNA found on the Tokarev itself. But to believe it completely, you must accept the following. A. Gerald Stanley did not know how many rounds he put into the Tokarev. B. Gerald Stanley, who believed he or his family were under threat, loaded his firearm with two shells and then fired both shells in the air, leaving the firearm empty and useless for self-defense but continued to carry it on his person. Gerald Stanley, this is C, Gerald Stanley tried to make the Tokarev safe by repeatedly pulling its trigger into the air, despite the fact that a dry fire of this nature can damage the firearm. Mm -hmm. D. Gerald Stanley took the time in this situation to make the Tokarev safe before proceeding to the vehicle he believed had run over his wife. And like it, seconds before, he's supposed to be too panicked to know how many bullets he's putting in, and then like seconds later, he's, he's sudden- making the gun safe as he strolls up to the vehicle to find out if his wife had been crushed. Yeah. E. Gerald Stanley believed the Bushy SUV had run over his wife, even though there was no explanation for his belief other than his wife not being on the lawnmower. F. Gerald Stanley went to the window of the vehicle to turn the vehicle off to immobilize it, even though the driver had exited the vehicle and Colton Bushy, the person nearest the steering wheel, was asleep or passed out, by Stanley's own admission. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he was just like (coughs) such a threat. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, G. Gerald Stanley used his left hand to attempt to turn off the vehicle ignition, keeping the firearm in his right hand, even though he claimed the firearm was made safe, and using your left hand through a driver's side window to turn off an ignition is incredibly awkward. And H. Gerald Stanley explained a hang fire, or rather experienced a hang fire, an extremely rare occurrence in itself, with a duration of many seconds, an almost impossible length of time for a hang fire. Gotta be at least a minute or so. At the precise second, his Tokarev was aimed at close range at Colton Bushy's skull. So this sounds like bullshit to me. Mm-hmm. Regardless of the fact that anyone who has a gun knows that you don't point it at someone unless you want to shoot them. Yeah, you don't. Mm-hmm. You point it everywhere but. Yep, keep yep. your finger off the fucking trigger and don't point it at anything you're not willing to destroy. Yeah. Yep. And every and every dipshit on the internet doesn't understand like what went on. Like They all cite castle doctrine and you gotta protect your land, you gotta protect yourself, you gotta protect your wife. You know, if somebody comes on your land, you shoot them dead and all yeah. that shit. But it's totally irrelevant to what happened. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So points A, C, D, E, and F make Mr. Stanley's story very difficult to believe. Mm. Points B and G simply make no logical sense whatsoever. Point H is beyond reason and is a submission somewhere along the lines of the magic bullet that shot JFK. Mm-hmm. While the story raised by Mr. Stanley is not impossible in the way that suggesting Colton Bushy having died of a heart attack 10 seconds before he was shot is not, by way of example, impossible, in my opinion, it is extreme. It is an extreme stretch to suggest that a story of this level of credibility should raise a reasonable doubt as to Mr. Stanley's intentions. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 
Formerly from Saskatchewan, Chris Murphy is now a Toronto-based lawyer representing the Bushy family. He's been in North Battleford for this week's preliminary hearing. Chris joins me now just outside the courthouse in North Battleford. Chris, when we talked last week, you said you felt there would be enough evidence to send this case to trial. So today's decision must not come as a surprise to you. No, it doesn't come as a surprise at all. Uh, his Honor committed Gerald Stanley to stand trial in the Court of Queen's Bench for second degree murder today. And I think that obviously that there was plenty of evidence for him to make that conclusion. What was it like to be in the courtroom for this hearing over the course of the week, considering the racial tension that has surrounded this case since it started last summer? Well, Monday was a very difficult day for the family, especially in the morning, uh, just the way that the evidence came out. and very emotional for the family on Monday and the emotions carried through the week and today there was a, a gathering before court started and uh, I think it was just a very good way to conclude the week uh, for just with regards to the, the community coming together and and just asking for there to be justice in this case Re regardless of what the verdict's going to be that's what the, the the feeling and the vibe was today that everybody here just wants there to be justice done at the end of the day, regardless of the verdict. Was there any interaction between those people who were there to support the accused, Mr. Stanley, and uh, those there to support the memory of Colton Bushy? I, I mean, not, not, not certainly nothing volatile. I, I don't know whether or not there was any interaction, but it was a very, very peaceful um, gathering today. And certainly, uh, the, the, like I say, the, the feeling here was, was one of support. Were there any surprises in your view this week? Well, I'm not really, we're not really entitled to comment on the evidence per se, but I think that once the trial commences, that some people will be surprised. I, I guess that's probably as far as I could go. Understandably. Um, and yeah, and again, I, I think, I think that. The, when, when people observe ultimately the trial, they're, they're going to have a, 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 a very good understanding of what's alleged to have occurred on August the 9th, 2016. Why did you decide that you'd like to take this case? Well, my practice in Ontario uh, is about half legal aid, half paying clients, and many of the clients that I've got suffer from mental illness and um, are, are people that are in, in need of, of help and that's not the case obviously uh, with, with, with the family here but there, there are similar sort of issues at play in Saskatchewan in the justice system in Saskatchewan and I'm not talking about this case specifically but there as, as everyone is aware the statistics are overwhelming that there's a disproportionate number of Indigenous people who are arrested and who are jailed in Saskatchewan. And again, not commenting on this case specifically, but there is a lot of work to be done in Saskatchewan to make sure that Indigenous, the Indigenous population is treated the same way as the non-Indigenous population. And so that's really the reason why I was so interested in taking on this case, but also, of course, being able to assist the Bushi family um, get, th get through and navigate this system. Just like magical occurrence on top of magical occurrence. Indeed. Yeah. This, from what I have reviewed, is a fair synopsis of Mr. Stanley's evidence that the homicide of Colton Bushi was accidental. If you read it and catch any errors, feel free to point them out, and I may revise them as I have included a link to the CBC synopsis below. I am not sharing this information to tell you what mis to tell you Mr. Stanley is guilty. Whether he is guilty beyond a reasonable doubt is for the jury to decide. Rather, I hope it assists folks in understanding what the trial has been about, what it is clearly not about, and the extreme, extremely specific chain of unlikely events the jury will have to believe occurred in order to accept Mr. Stanley's incredible version of events. Mm -hmm. My thoughts continue to be with the mother and the family of Colton through this difficult time. Mm -hmm. End quote. Thanks, Rob Feist. <laughs> Yeah, thanks, Rob Feist, friend of the show. Thank you. Yeah. And if any of you grew up in rural areas, like going, driving down the back roads and sometimes stopping off at people's yards to maybe 
borrow gas or use the bathroom. Like, that's a par- fairly common occurrence. Like but I none of it warrants getting fucking murdered. Oh, no. None of it. Yeah, I read um, somewhere on Facebook that some, some white guy had written, like, yeah, we used to go around all the time and even, like, steal stuff yeah. and whatever, but it was just always chalked up well, to boys who, being boys. Who was that one farmer who stole, like, one point some million oh, yeah, dollars guy. worth of farm equipment and got fucking house arrest? Yeah. 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 I grew up in a rural town where... A local farmer had been shot by people out joyriding, shooting at signs. Mm-hmm. So guns and random shootings were uh, not really very popular around where I grew up. But even those farmers sitting around Coffee Row were all like, well, you know, I don't want my stuff stolen. I'm like, I I don't get it. I don't own anything that I would value more than Any anybody life. else's life. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, even if Colton was a fucking thief, even if he was there to steal shit, mm-hmm. your obligation as that landowner is to call the RCMP, wait, observe them carefully, maybe follow them in your vehicle if they try to escape, and just wait for the cops to get there. There is no excuse, in in my mind, outside of a military or police setting, to point a gun at someone's head, ever. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. No, the, my personal opinion. And the, later on, his wife was inside, wasn't she? Yeah, she was inside. She was never, she was off the mower, but was not under the vehicle. Yeah. It just, that's what strikes me is so odd, is his turning off the ignition. Yeah. Like, the, the windshield has already been smashed out. It's, the vehicle's not going anywhere. Mm-hmm. Nobody's in the driver's another, seat. It's up against another vehicle. It's up against another vehicle. It's, that's, a, it's mm-hmm. complete bullshit. It's got a flat. Did they not have? Mm-hmm. And in my opinion, all it takes is one of those A through H to be bullshit and the case falls apart because you need every single one of those in sequence to be true in order for this defense of an accident to hold any weight. Mm-hmm. Yep. You need him to forget the bullets. You need him to forget, like, you need all those things to happen in order for a story to make sense, to make it happened that he was in the right state of mind to accidentally murder. Well, and, and by all accounts, Gerald Stanley was an expert marksman. Yeah. He's used guns in, in his, his entire life, including this pistol. How in the fuck, as an expert marksman with a perfect safety record, do you not know how many fucking bullets you put in the chamber? Yeah. Well, uh, we could also say, like, he was caught up in the heat of the he was moment. He caught up in the heat of the moment, but still, why are you pointing a gun at someone's No, exactly. Head? I'm not well, defending It's super it, hard to count to three. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think also notable is that, uh, I don't know, Stanley and his um, safety nature or, or the nature of, uh, I guess, his attitude towards firearm safety um, is generally seems to be questionable at best. Um, basically, after the uh, Colton Bushi trial went through, uh, he ended up uh, having to pay uh, $3,900 in fines and he received a 10 year ban on gun ownership uh, because this guy doesn't know how to lock his fucking guns up. Oh, yeah. And, yeah. you know, so I mean, this guy seems to be a gun nut to begin with, you know, because I mean, any responsible gun owner knows you put the three locks on it and, uh, yeah. you know, to protect it from thieves and accidental, and, discharge, yeah, accidental discharge and yeah. all that shit. Shit. And you store your guns and your ammo in separate safes and you mm-hmm. know, always know where that shit is. And you tell the RCMP where your shit is so when they come into your house be, or if there's a fire, the firefighters know, hey, there's ammunition that's potentially explosive mm-hmm. in this case. Well, and I guess the fundamental rule one that was already mentioned, don't put a gun at something you're not going to fucking pull the trigger on. Yeah. And it just so happened to be pointing right at the base of Colton's skull. Yeah. You know, kind of like rear execution style. Like, I, yeah. I, I understand like that the round went through, like, the back of his head. Yeah. Out well, the he's front. Slumped over. You know, and, and so it's like, yeah. that's like execution style. You I, know? And, like, and through, I, you're shooting some back of some guy's head. I, I would like <laughs> to agree with you and completely in saying that this was, in every way, an execution style mm-hmm. murder this was not an a it's not an accident b it's not a killing c it's a fucking execution on a june night in 1999 a group of drunken partying teens in pickup trucks drove onto weibo ludwig's farmyard in northern alberta now ludwig was a notorious local figure he was a charismatic evangelical preacher and eco-terrorist who operated from his trickle creek family commune At the time, Ludwig was a suspect in a series of sabotage attacks on oil and gas installations. That night, the teens drove onto the Ludwig family compound and started stunting in their trucks, near a spot where Ludwig's grandchildren were camped out in tents. Someone, we've never known who, fired a gun at the vehicles. Two teens were hit, and one of them, 16-year-old Carmen Willis, died. 
no one was ever charged in her death. The case sharply divided Alberta, and a surprising number of people rallied to Weibo Ludwig's defense. Many rural Albertans who had despised him for his environmental extremism suddenly rushed to support him and to justify his family's right to protect themselves. I've been thinking about Carmen a lot, especially since Saskatchewan farmer Gerald Stanley was acquitted of shooting and killing Colton Bushy after Bushy and a bunch of his pals drove onto the Stanley farmyard and attempted to steal an ATV. Of course, the racial dimension changes things. Of course it does. When you look at the way the RCMP mishandled the Stanley investigation, treating Colton Bushy's First Nations family like suspects instead of victims. When you look at the way the trial was handled, especially given it appears all Indigenous would-be jurors were eliminated from the jury panel by the defense. And when you look at some of the utterly vile and hateful response on social media, it's clear Stanley's acquittal has exposed a deep and ugly fault line in Canadian culture. And I in no way wish to minimize the racialized elements of this case in drawing a parallel to Carmen Willis. But while Colton Bushy's death is symbolic of just how far we are from true reconciliation on the prairies, I think Stanley's acquittal is also a symptom of another malaise, a deep-seated belief that rural Canadians, especially on the prairies, have a right to shoot to defend their property. Stanley's lawyer didn't make a self-defense argument. He'd argued the shooting was accidental. But of course, the idea that a man could use a gun to defend his own property was implicit, even if unspoken. And it's easy to understand why. Let me tell you about the case of Eugene Dalton, a 62-year-old Alberta farmer from Chard, about 100 kilometers south of Fort McMurray. In July of 2014, three intruders came onto his property at 4 a.m. to steal his ATV. Dalton fired at one of them with a shotgun, hitting and wounding Philip Janvier. But Dalton was acquitted of aggravated assault and other charges and found guilty only of having an unlicensed shotgun. The judge ruled Dalton acted in self-defense. Now let me tell you about Brian Knight. He was a farmer from central Alberta who pleaded guilty in 2009 to criminal negligence causing bodily harm. He'd fired a 12-gauge shotgun at three drunken young men who'd come onto his farmyard at night to steal an ATV, wounding one of them. Knight was originally sentenced to 90 days, but his sentence provoked such a huge national outcry from people who insisted he had a right to defend his property, eventually the Court of Appeal reduced his penalty to a conditional sentence. And now let me tell you about Jerry Bigchild, a resident and member of the Sunchild First Nation in central Alberta. He too fired a gun, a 22, at a teenager he thought was stealing his ATV. The kid had also trespassed on his property at night. And a Red Deer jury found Big Child guilty of careless use of a firearm, acquitted him of everything else, and gave him a conditional sentence. So, have we created a culture in which people think it's perfectly fine to shoot anyone who tries to steal your ATV? Have we normalized not just the right to self-defense, but the right to shoot to defend your stuff? Somehow I fear we've created a culture where rural people feel besieged and abandoned. On the prairies, they don't feel they can rely on the RCMP to help them. And by default, shooting at people feels like a legitimate response to trespassers and thieves. We don't just have a racism problem, though God knows we do. We don't just have a rural crime problem, so that's real too. We have a profound social breakdown where people feel so unsafe so isolated, so undefended by the police that shoot first, ask questions later, seems a justified response to intruders. And when the social contract breaks down that badly, we have a recipe for anarchy and for more heartbreak for families like Carmen's and Colton's. And the fact that he got, you can't have a gun for 10 years because you stored it poorly. It doesn't matter that you shot someone, but you Who's, stored your gun for him, Which so which one of you guys one. are covering the case? Me. Like, okay, do you want to go next? Yeah, I'll go next. Because hmm. I'm I'm really intrigued to see how he a didn't get the murder charge, but b how the fuck he got off without manslaughter. Right. Okay. All right. Here you go, Sage. So um, I have a quote from Kurt Dahl, who is a lawyer and also the drummer for <coughs> One Bad Son. And local I went to high school with him. He's a delight. Okay. So this is uh, from his Facebook. 
said the most powerful scene in the movie A Time to Kill is when Matthew McConaughey asks the jury to close their eyes as he describes the attack that occurred on a black girl and then says, now imagine she's white. That test shouldn't have to be applied in 2018 in Canada in the Colton Bushi trial, but sadly it does. I've read the facts over and over and cannot accept that the same verdict would have been applied if Colton was white. I'm not an expert in criminal procedure, but you don't have to be to know that the legal system failed the Bushi family. You don't have to be an expert to say this isn't right and this isn't right. So uh, the jury was uh, basically picked like the trial took place on uh, the 9th of February 2018 at the Court, Court of Queen's bench in North Battleford. The judge presiding was Martin Popescal, who apparently has another really sketchy history with RCMP and stuff. Prosecuting indigenous people. Yeah, mm-hmm. he's just kind of a shit. So um, the jury selection system allowed the trial lawyers to use the use of preemptory challenges, which basically meant that they could reject a certain am- amount of uh, potential jurors for no specific reason. Mm-hmm. So out of the 750 people summoned, they 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 mark you're marked a certain amount of people for like in the in the area and then kind of sent out the summonses across Saskatchewan. But out of the 750 people that were summoned, only 204 actually showed up. And all five people who showed up and looked like they might be indigenous were challenged by the defense, mm-hmm. leaving an all-white jury. And for those of you that don't, don't know what preemptory challenges is, is it basically a way for both the defense and the prosecution to be able to eliminate jury members. And usually they're allowed to do it by any basis they want. Um, they're, they're not allowed to do it along like sexist or racist or like it lines Which like that. Which they can do anyway. They yes, can do it. They just, just find they did, some other reason. Yeah, they just have to find some other reason. So say... I don't like the cut of his jib. Yeah, say I wanted to eliminate an indigenous person. Um, but I didn't right. want to say the reason was because they're indigenous. I could say like, oh, uh, you know, he, he lived in a, he lived in a neighboring uh, reserve to Colton Bush's family. So yeah, he, he was too close to the case. Yeah, so mm-hmm. too close to the case, now he's gone and all that. Or, yeah. Anything like that, like he could, he could be like uh, he worked at a coffee shop that sometimes Colton went to. And you could, you could find anything to reject. Them. Well, and also, like they said, they could, they could reject them for no specific reason. They could just be like, yeah, nope, out. Joining me now from Saskatoon for more analysis and understanding around the jury selection that happened today, I'm joined by defense lawyer Brian Pfefferly. Hi, Brian. Hi, Jill. We were just listening to Charles Hamilton describe that only a fraction of the potential jurors came out for the selection process today at Gerald Stanley's trial. Is that normal? Well, it's certainly normal that a large number won't show up. I mean, percentage-wise, you know, usually somewhere around a third won't show up. Uh, when uh, more than half don't show up, that would be slightly unusual, but there can be any reason why that can occur. Sometimes, although 750 might have been called, there might have been a number of jurors that would have contacted the sheriff's office in advance, indicating they're out of town or out of the country or, or whatever. And so maybe that 750 might have only looked like 500 and then and then about half of the 500 showed up. So it's hard to say uh, how many were excused prior to today. Um, but one would have expected more than 200, but I, I, I'm sure that that was part of the thought process in making sure so many were called. Right, cast your net wide and then you'll be able to whittle it down. They've got their 12. This trial, the case leading up to, to today's jury selection, there's been so much conversation about it. It is high profile. So how can lawyers make sure that they are picking jurors who are not biased? It's so difficult, and, and a lot of it comes down to essentially a gut feeling, and, and I always say uh, that it's uh, more of an art than a science, and sometimes it, when, when you're selecting your jury, the accused and the juror, the, the potential juror actually look at each other, and the judge uh, through the clerk will say, a juror look upon the accused, accused look upon the juror, and, and sometimes you get that gut feeling, you see a, 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 a stare down or a smirk or something that just doesn't sit right and you say, ah, I don't really want this person on my jury or yeah, I do want this person on my jury. Um, it's more of a hunch than anything and, and you know, it just maybe a hope and a prayer more than more than any uh, anything else. Um, defense counsel will typically try to get a bit of a playbook. We'll have the names of the jurors and because of social media and whatnot, we could sometimes Google them and find some information about the juror uh, themselves. But it's it's 
somewhat limited. Uh, we have to base it off uh, stereotypical views of what a certain person from a certain profession might do, uh, the age demographic, is this person involved in religious organizations, are they supporting the SASC party, supporting the NDP, supporting the Liberals, supporting the federal Conservatives on their Facebook pages, those sorts of things you look for and then you try to make a decision that would fit with, uh, with the theory of your case. You're certainly trying to make your best choices and decisions and judgments based on what you see as a lawyer. And for jurors, as they listen to a case and start to form their own decisions, how do we know that they aren't being biased and, and basing these decisions on their personal views versus the letter of the law, which is what they're entrusted to do? I think it comes down to the consciousness of, of people and the community, and, and I, I believe in the jury system as a lawyer. I, I know that I've represented First Nations people before and, and hoped for more First Nations representation on the jury, and ultimately found that the jury listened to our arguments and were very fair. And I think at the end of the day, this comes down to the fact that the judge is going to take control of this. He's going to remind the jury jurors of their duty, and it's not going to be a duty that anyone would take lightly. Uh, they're going to, no doubt, in my view, based on my experience, take that duty very seriously. So I think it's it's a situation where one always sort of anticipates uh, a certain demographical representation. But at the end of the day, the judge is going to control the jury through the jury instructions and and juries, I believe, listen to those instructions very intently, and they do take their role very seriously. So I would anticipate the judge taking control of, uh, of that and fully expect it, the judge to use the usual instructions that they do in giving juries uh, the, the, the bias uh, um, uh, cautions that, that they normally do. We're hearing from Colton Bushy's family some concern that, in their view, there isn't anyone who's Indigenous on the jury, although we haven't independently confirmed that, but they're raising it as a concern. Should they be concerned? Well, I, I you know, I, I understand First Nations people involved in the justice system uh, often, I think, have felt like they're on the outside looking in. Uh, and uh, I understand that that can be a concern. Uh, I think a couple of things that I, I would note as a defense lawyer, of course, it's the accused's right to a trial uh, and a fair trial, and they are entitled to uh, use their peremptory challenges and pick a jury along with the Crown that they believe is com comprised of a fair represent representative sample of the community. Is there any data? anything more hard and fast as to whether all white juries would be more sympathetic towards white defendants or is that something that just has turned into a bit of a perception as you say i think it's a bit of a perception although we we sometimes turn to the united states for some of these these sort of uh, uh thoughts i think anecdotally uh it's hard to to know because every case is different but the united states i think that there's an understanding that visible minorities are are more typically likely to uh, acquit or find the accused not guilty than to convict them um so that being hispanic and and african-american people in the united states they keep different data because they can of course contact jurors and have discussions with them where in canada we have a i think a, frankly a better system that is confidential and maintains the integrity of, of the jury process. But but uh, it's so hard to know what will be, uh, you know, sort of the, the composition of this jury ethnically. We know male and female quite easily. I think we can we can say that. But ethnically, it's, it's so difficult to know. And I, I believe that gut feeling is what it comes down to. And if jurors are challenged, it's usually on that gut feeling more than more than on stereotypes. Uh, it's the look that they gave or didn't give to the accused and, and that sort of thing. So it's only the first day and I'm already, you know, feeling a bit overwhelmed. Um, with the jury selection, I came on behalf of my family, a lot of my family, um, a lot of my family didn't come today because they already felt that a decision had been made and I came with hopes that it would be different. It was really difficult to sit there today and watch every single visible indigenous person be challenged by the defense. It's not surprising, but extremely frustrating. 
and it's something that we feared has come true. I'm unsure how to feel about how the proceedings are gonna go from here on out, but we'll continue to be at the courthouse every day. And that's all I have to say about that. Uh, so Gerald Stanley's defense lawyer, Scott Spencer, relied super heavily on the hang fire defense, like what uh, what Leon explained, meaning that the gun just randomly went off and Stanley totally didn't mean to shoot a passed out kid in the seat of an SUV. Yeah, it's it's also it's a, either a defect in the metal of the bullet or it's a defect in the gunpowder and it takes longer than usual to fire. Mm-hmm. I interviewed, um, didn't record the interview, just emailed back and forth mm-hmm. with the um, president of the Saskatoon Gun Club. Mm-hmm. And he said in his 40 years of professional shooting, uh, including with the handgun in question, mm-hmm. he's never had a hang fire right. ever. Mm-hmm. Well, they're like they're like stupid rare. Yeah. Uh, so hang fires are, like I said, like stupendously rare and usually only cause a less than one second delay between the trigger being pulled and the gun going off. Can we explain what a hang fire is? Would you like me to? Yeah, do mm-hmm. it. So you've got your shell. Mm-hmm. Um, on the one end is a bullet with the pointy end sh- pushing out. Mm-hmm. On the back end, you have the firing cap, which is a little circle inside the rest of the shell. Yeah. Under normal circumstances, which is literally every fucking time, <laughs> the hammer in the gun hits either the center of the... Um, um, what did I just call it? The, ce- the, the center of the firing cap, or sometimes they're called rim fires, where they hit the side of the of the firing cap. At any rate, as soon as it hits the firing cap, the black powder inside cordite, followed by black powder, powder explodes, expelling the bullet out the front of the gun. Mm-hmm. The idea with one of these hang fires is that it hits the cordite, but the cordite instead of exploding smolders mm. and it burns for one or two seconds, and then hits the rest of the gunpowder and explodes. So this idea that that cordite was in there combusting slowly, Super smoldering slow. for minutes before While it exploded. While he's moseying over. Impossible. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, the one or two second hang <coughs> fires are rare. The one or two minutes that it would take for him to dry fire, take the magazine out, check the keys, get the keys. I mean, the, the cordite would have had to have stopped burning mm-hmm. for a while, mm-hmm. then changed its mind, <laughs> yeah. and continued to be burned, followed by the black powder. Yep, yep. yep. Yeah. So um, another main argument from the defense was that Stanley was reacting to a like very intense situation, mm. which I mean, fair. He was, but also you don't shoot people in the head. My my suggestion is that if he was in fact dealing with an emergency situation, call the cops. He would have been on Bushi a hell of a lot faster than the few minutes it took him to slowly stride over there, mm-hmm. make sure his wife wasn't under the car, la di da di da di da, and then shot Colton. Yep. Yeah. No, it's, it 100% seems like bullshit. Gosh, his wife is lucky she wasn't under the car. It could have hang fired while he was looking <laughs> exactly. for her. Exactly. Yeah. 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 And, yeah. and even if it was a panic situation, like it seems like the the job of the justice system should be if if you decide to shoot people when you become panicked, maybe you shouldn't be in society until we fix that problem. Right. Oh, well, let's not talk about get get me started about cops that do that. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> I felt afraid, so I killed the unarmed person. Yeah. Yeah. That um, was running away. Yeah. <laughs> I killed the uh, unarmed autistic man that was sitting on the ground. Yeah. Mm. Anyway, so the Crown's main argument was basically that Gerald Stanley fired two warning shots up into the air. Totally legal. Mm-hmm. That's that's cool. Stupid. And then you don't stupid, fire warning though, shots into the air because those bullets will come, will come down back and down. Kill but you. but it's not it's not illegal to do it. It's not yeah. illegal to do it. Mm-hmm. It's just stupid. But then he walked up to the SUV and deliberately shot Colton in the head while he was unconscious or sleeping, passed out or sleeping. Mm-hmm. So uh, the chief justice Martel Popescal, I cannot pronounce his name, told jurors that they had three choices if they found sorry they had three choices. If they found beyond a reasonable doubt that Stanley intended to shoot Bushi, he was guilty of second degree murder. Mm. If Stanley did not mean to shoot Bushi, but his actions were careless and he ought to have known someone could be hurt, he should be found guilty of the lesser included offense of manslaughter. Oh, like pointing a gun at somebody's head, whether or not you think it's loaded? If Stanley's actions were reasonable, the judge said, he must be acquitted. 
The interesting <laughs> thing about manslaughter, though, is it's a pretty broad definition. Basically, it's when you kill someone in the commission of a different crime. Hmm. And in the case of Stanley... Or an po- accidental. Pointing a, gun at Sta- pointing a gun at Colton Bushy was a crime in itself. Yes. Hmm. You can't point a, a loaded gun at someone. Yeah. And if Colton died as a result of the gun being illegally pointed, even if it was an accident, yeah. it's still manslaughter because you can't point a loaded... You can't point a gun at people. That's right. that's a threat threat to life, which is a crime. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. I have pulled keys out of a car with my left hand, stopping someone from driving drunk from my house. And if I had had a gun, there was no way I could shoot someone in the head because I had to well, you have to my like, right shoulder away from mm. the car and reach over the column to get the keys and turn them off and pull them out. When I first read Rob Feist's account of the trial, I went to a couple different cars that my friends owned and I pretended to hold a pistol in my right hand and tried to turn. It is so fucking awkward and it is so awkward that it is senseless that you would not trade hands and put the gun in your left and reach around. I mean, the way you've got to turn your left arm around clockwise in order to get over there to get the keys. It, uh, my wrist itself is not flexible enough to pull the keys out of the ignition yeah. to have the, the torque I need between my thumb and forefinger to turn it off. It's impossible for me to do. Yeah. Well, and he, um, Gerald Stanley was a pretty big guy. Yeah. Like, he's got a lot of a lot of shoulders to deal with. Yeah. In all that turning and reaching and pointing guns and whatnot. My opinion is if it had been a car full of white kids, we wouldn't be having this discussion. Oh, fuck oh, no. Oh, fuck oh, no. no. They, they'd, no have, they'd have had no. their tire fixed to ride home and, and, and a call to their parents. Yeah, here, would you like a beer while you're waiting? Yeah. 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 You, or, you, or they would have stolen something and then... Oh, it's just kids being kids. Yeah, it's just boys being just boys. Just local Whatever. boys blown off steam. Mm-hmm. And you know what? Like, I was that dipshit. Like, I, like uh, when I was a young man, like a, a stupid young man, like, I used to go to, like, farmer's yards and, like, steal gnomes and shit. And, like, what hit me hard in this case is if I was an indigenous kid and I was up to the same shit I was, the exact same shit, I might have gotten a bullet in my head. Mm-hmm. Like I was, I was performing mischief. Like yeah. I was, I was a dumb little kid. Like, you were out stealing shit. Yeah, mm-hmm. and like, and I did the same thing. I used to drive out to small towns and steal lawn gnomes. Yeah, that's where my mom's lawn gnomes went. You bastard. Probably, yeah. yeah. Alrighty, that was part one of our Colton Bushy coverage and the tragedy that surrounds that. And if you would like to hear part two, it's already on Patreon for as little as a dollar a month www.patreon.com slash ovpod um as a palate cleanser we are playing idol no more the colton bushy tribute by the artist money mart from fast money records canada enjoy <laughs> A white jury came up with a verdict of not guilty of Gerald Stanley, who shot and killed my nephew. This is false. They treat us First Nations people. And it's not right. Something has to be done about this. The government, Justin Trudeau. We asked you. Give us Indian, indigenous people justice. I don't know more. You stole our land, now our people are poor. Assign us a band and sent us to war. You took all the oil, but still you want more. I don't know more. You beat us to death, to stop us in cages. Cut down our trees to build all your places. Poison our people and laugh in our faces. But now you forget like you burnt all the pages. I don't know more. You stole our land, now our people are poor. Assign us a band and sent us to war. You took all the oil, but still you want more. I don't know more. You beat us to death. Out my son. 
emotions are running high here. I don't know more. You stole our land, now our people are poor. Assign us a band and sent us to war. You took all the oil, but still you want more. I don't know more. You beat us to death to stop us in cages. Cut down our trees to build all your places. Poison our people and laugh in our faces. But now you forget like you burnt all the pages. I don't know more. You stole our land, now our people are poor. Assign us a band and sent us to war. You took all the oil, but still you want more. I don't know more. You beat us to death to stop us in cages. Cut down our trees to build all your places. As you say, a jury has acquitted Gerald Stanley of second-degree murder in the shooting death of Colton Bushi. They haven't been represented throughout these entire legal proceedings, and this is because of a lack of visibly identifiable Indigenous people on the jury, Andrew. We will not stop our pursuit for justice. Hello and welcome to the after show. I am Sage Murray along with Leon Pilger, Ood Gallifrey, and Richard Bigley. Hey, okay, so we got a letter from Canadian Girl from Nothing Ever Happens in Canada podcast. So mm-hmm. I'm just like fangirling a little bit. Yeah. And she sent us a bunch of, stick- bunch of stickers. So her note says, You guys rock. You truly are one of my fave shows. I love how real you guys are and your openness about mental health is so needed in this world today. I wish more people knew how awesome you guys are. Thanks for supporting my little show. It means the world to me. Canadian girl. P.S. I have vandalized four bathrooms so far right with, with stickers that uh, Leon sent her. So Fuck yeah. I vandalized four bathrooms, but I didn't actually have any stickers. <laughs> yeah, didn't do that portion. Yeah. Oh boy. Well, yeah, so I'm I'm very excited to get the, this uh, letter from Canadian girl. So thank you so much for the stickers and uh, I love your show. Yeah. And we definitely recommend our podcast. Uh, Nothing ever happens in Canada is awesome. Yeah. You know, it's another little Canadian show about strange things that happens in Canada. So mm-hmm. check it out. Yeah, check it out. It's great. All right. So for the after show, I'm Sage Murray. Leon Tugger. Ood Gallifrey. Richard Bigley. <laughs> okay, bye. Bye-bye. I'm sorry. It was, it was that bizarre thing where I'm like, well, it's not my turn to talk. It's yeah. after show. Oh, wait. Yes, it is. Holy